All right, I'm really happy to be here. I love this church. I love to come back and fill in whenever I can for Pastor Waxer, and uh, Aaron's always been a good buddy of mine, and great to be here with the YWAMers sending them out. So, the message this morning is called The Next Big Thing, subtitled, Ananias and the Next Big Thing. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Acts chapter 9, and I'll give you a little... Uh, background on that as we go. But before we go on, I've got a book table in the back and I want to make an <clears throat> unashamed uh, commercial break uh, for a brand new book I just wrote. It just came out about a month ago. And uh, this actually got started in um, several years ago and I'll tell you the story in a minute. But uh, what it's all about is doing the next thing God tells you to do. And a lot of times we, we don't do anything because we want to do a big thing but we define what is big and little in between our little ears. Now that's really understandable in the world because you know, we have Peyton Manning getting a big contract this last week and we have bodybuilders that big build, build big bodies and we have entrepreneurs that build big companies and movie stars with big egos and on and on it can go because big, uh, big is good, right? Everything big is good, and if you're good, you're going to be big, and if you're not big, that means you're no good, right? That's the way, that's what the world wants you to believe. And we're going to look at two people today. One's named is Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the Apostle. That's pretty big, yeah? I mean, outside of Jesus, he's probably the most famous Christian in history, so that's pretty big. Ananias is this other guy, not so big. He's only mentioned for a couple of verses that we're going to read in a minute, and uh, uh, he comes onto the scene, he has his 15 minutes of fame, and then he fades into obscurity. But without Ananias, there would be no Paul the Apostle. And so I want to talk about how Ananias responded to the next thing God called him to do. But his thing was just as big as Paul's, because in God's eyes, Paul, God needed an Ananias before he could get himself a Paul. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain all that and unpack that uh, in just a minute when we get there. But uh, this book is all about faithfulness in the little things and watching out for spiritual pride in the big things. They retail for $12.99, but because you're my very good friends, I give you a very good deal. <laughs> a signed copy signed to any of your friends for Christmas presents or Easter presents or Groundhog Day presents or whatever it might be, uh, you can get those afterwards and I'll be happy to personalize it for your friends. But uh, let's read. Acts chapter 9, verse 10. Now, a little bit of background to the story. If you look at the first nine verses of Acts chapter 9, there's a famous story that many of you have heard before. It actually starts out the chapter, and it says, Now Saul of Tarsus, who was a big self-righteous Pharisee, it says he was breathing out threatenings and murder against the disciples of the Lord. How many of you know that sounds a little negative? threatenings and murder. Now, it's interesting, the Greek word for breathing out here is a word that refers to the way horses snort. <laughs> In other words, he was, <laughs> he was breathing. <laughs> you ever get really hyperactive and you hyperventilate? You get so mad at something. <laughs> you get so mad you almost pass out because you're just so hyper about it. You're looking at me kind of spiritual like you never get mad, you know. <laughs> I get mad like that all the time. <laughs> Uh, just kidding. My wife and I got in an argument the other day and I got kind of mad at her and I said, I can't believe God made you so beautiful and made you so stupid at the same time. <laughs> and she said, that's easy, Danny. He made me beautiful so you'd marry me and he made me stupid so I'd marry you. <laughs> that's just a joke. It's just a joke. Sometimes I forget to say it's a joke and my wife gets all these calls. Your husband's such an idiot. Why did he call you stupid? You know. But um, anyway, so Saul is breathing out threatenings and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He's riding on his horse on the way to Damascus, and he's going to let those Christians get it, man, because they're coming up against them. And he's going to get these Christians. He's going to persecute them. And Saul is big, but God's a little bigger. And so God says, I think I'll take him. Whack. And so he knocks Saul down off of his horse. He's blind. And then he goes, uh, what are you trying to tell me, Lord? And the Lord says, um, you're persecuting my people. And uh, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, uh, who are you, Lord? And he says, my name is Jesus. Read my lips, although you can't read right now because you're blind. But uh, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting because you're persecuting my people. And then he says, um, uh, what did he say then? My mind just spaced out there for a second. Uh, so where's Aaron's meds? No, no I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
But uh, he said, uh, who are you that I'm, I'm he says, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. And then he says, sit there for three days. Now, it says in the text that we're going to read in just a minute, he was sitting there praying. Now, how many of you know if you get knocked off your horse, you're blind for three days. You can only have 72 hours to think about what you've been doing, uh, but you're going to be pretty obedient to what he tells you to do. So God says to him, I'm going to send this guy named Ananias to you, and he's going to get you healed and get you all fixed up, and then you're going to be enlisted in my service. And so uh, uh, he says, okay, and that's where we pick up the story here with Ananias coming on the scene. Verse 10 of Acts 9. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision and said, Ananias. He said, yes, Lord. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and before the kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food he regained his strength. Now if you keep your finger there and go over a couple of pages to Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. So you got the story of Ananias in chapter 9, and then he's giving his testimony in Jerusalem a couple years later, and he recounts what happened that day on the road to Damascus. And we pick it up in Acts 22, verse 12. Paul's telling the story right after God had blinded him with a bright light, and he says, A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law. So he was a man of good character. He was highly respected. He had a good reputation by all the Jews living there. I love this. He stood beside me. He didn't stand over me. He wasn't condemning me. He wasn't putting me down. He stood beside me. And he said, Brother Saul, second time he says that, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you to, number one, know his will. Number two, see the righteous one. Number three, to hear words from his mouth. Number four, and you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash away your sins, and call on the name of the Lord. So Ananias was God's chosen instrument at this particular time to get a hold of this guy, Paul. Now, as I said earlier, we are being sold through the media, through advertising, even when we work, we sleep, we, 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 we have friends, we're around us, we're constantly in this uh, constant pursuit of bigness. Then we get saved and we read verses like uh, John the Baptist saying, he must increase, I must decrease. Uh, it's little mustard seeds that grow into big trees. It's little pieces of leaven that, or yeast that go into a dough of bread and make it rise. Uh, we're to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt us in his proper time. And um, Jeremiah telling Baruch, Baruch, are you seeking big things for yourself? Don't seek big things. And so all this stuff in the Bible, we, we, we meet Jesus and then all of a sudden our worlds collide and the world we're living in seems different from the world that's described in this book. But I want to suggest that we go by God's definition of what is big and what is little and not ours. And I'm going to tell you how this first came about. Um, a few years ago, I, I serve on the board or uh, I'm a, this, these YWAMers we just prayed for here, they're from Honolulu. And um, I was the YWAM leader here for a long time of the Honolulu base. Now I'm kind of a more of an international floating kind of guy. And I'm on this thing called the Global Leadership Team. And we have about 20,000 workers uh, in 177 countries, and we're doing our best to evangelize the world. 
And so every year I got to go to these leadership meetings. So I went to this meeting in London, England. This was about four or five years ago. And a little background, my wife's mom had had a brain aneurysm and needs 24-hour care. So she came to live with us in Waipahu. So my wife was taking care of her all the time. And, you know, we're just kind of doing like a little, our own little uh, care home there. And uh, I was in England and I called back to my wife uh, for a little chat. And she says, uh, how's it going? What are you doing? And then I just started out, I wasn't trying to sound big or important, but I was just telling her what I was doing. And I was dropping names and, you know, talking about, a, well, we're reaching 800 million oral learners over here with the Orality Project. And then we're working with Campus Crusade over here on the Jesus film. And then uh, we're, we're getting the books translated into these languages. And then we've got uh, church planting strategies for unreached people groups. And we've got underground churches in China. And we're multiplying Bible schools over here. And I'm meeting with the director of operation mobilization next Wednesday for lunch and me and this guy were doing something. And then I realized the whole conversation was revolving around me. So I said to my wife, I said, well, golly, I've been talking about me for 10 minutes straight. Why don't you talk about me for a while? <laughs> no, just kidding. So, um, but I'm, I'm in this one-sided conversation and then the Holy Spirit says, well, ask her how she's doing. I said, oh, by the way, honey, uh, how you doing? She says, oh, I'm doing really good. I just got through wiping your mother-in-law's rear end and experiencing the presence of God. <laughs> and I said, oh, because I, I don't know if you were taken back by a minute ago by the, uh, you know, talking about underwear for the homeless, but we're going to get practical here. How many of you know Jesus said, he that is the greatest, the biggest among you shall be the servant of all. Yes. And she was being the servant of all, and I was being, the, and I'm, whoo, maybe what I'm doing is not that big after all in the eyes of God. Maybe what she's doing is just as big as what I'm doing. And maybe big and little need to be redefined in my own mind. And uh, so I'd like you to think about that, the words big and little in your mind, especially if you have an inordinate desire to be big. Now, it has to be balanced by, you know, God wants us to evangelize the whole world. He wants us to make disciples of all the nations. He wants us to rock these islands for Jesus Christ. Is that right? He wants us to have big visions and big dreams. And we just heard Michelle talk about God uh, multiplying her vision. So that's not to put that down. But it is to say, what are we, why do we experience so much stress and frustration and anger and we don't seem to be happy people when we should be the most joyful people in the world because it's all settled? Amen. Like, for instance, an author like me, I can write a book and I can, I can let's say I sell 35,000 copies of the book, but then I can get jealous of Rick Warren because he sold 35 million copies of his book. But then some other little author over here might say, well, I've only sold 3,500 of my book, and I wish I could be like Danny Lehman. He sells 35,000, and Danny Lehman's jealous of Rick Warren because he sells 35 million. It's a lose-lose all the way around. If I compare myself to this guy, I get proud. If I compare myself to this guy, um, I feel all intimidated, and God doesn't want... It says in 2 Corinthians, if you measure yourselves by yourselves and compare yourselves among yourselves, you're not wise. So God gives each of us a kuleana or a responsibility of something that he wants us to do, but I want to suggest it'll be the next thing that God puts in front of you. It could be saying, God bless you to the person next to you. It could be giving 10 bucks a month or 20 bucks a month to sponsor a child for Compassion International. Now here we have a visual metaphor today. Here's a girl sitting in the middle of squalor in the middle of the Philippines. Fast forward the tape. Somebody put a couple of bucks into to a Compassion International offering. It goes to Michelle. Here she graduates with a master's degree from Moody Bible Institute and she's not going on to pursue the American or the Filipino dream. She's going back to the Philippines to pay it forward because somebody paid it into her life. Now I say amen to that. My, uh, probably my second best friend in the whole world went to be with the Lord a couple years ago. His name was Kevin and uh, fought a real courageous battle with cancer. But uh, I want to tell you about Kevin. Uh, and it, it'll relate to this uh, doing little things. We trained Kevin as a missionary back in the 80s up in Manoa, the same campus that all these folks here have come from. We sent him to the, Phil to the Philippines as a missionary. This was in the pre-Marcos days, and then he was there through the revolution and after the Marcos days. And uh, we gave him contextualization strategies and strategies for church planting and language learning skills and so forth. And we sent him in there and told him how to do friendship evangelism and how to start a new church from scratch. And... Um, uh, and he was doing all that, but a real turning point in his life came when he was in a place called the Smoky Mountain Garbage Dump. Now, praise God, that thing got shut down a few years ago because it was one of the most horrid living existences you can imagine. And so 
this little girl was there named Rosalinda. She was 18 months old and looked like a horror movie. I've got pictures of her. Of she's laying there with her eyeballs are sticking out, sunken into her, into her eye sockets. Uh, her hair is all unkempt. Her, her arms are about as skinny as pencils. And she's just laying there just waiting to die. Her mother would leave her for a couple of hours every day to go into, to out to see the, the new garbage dumps would come down and the garbage cans uh, or the garbage trucks would dump out the garbage and all these Filipino parents uh, in this place, these poor people, they'd go through little, I, I remember getting up close to one of them, they had eggshells, and they were picking out the leftover eggs out of the eggshells and putting them into a little bag so they could take them home and give it to Rosalinda as well as the other several thousand people that lived on the garbage dump. Praise the Lord for the Filipino government who has come in and, like I said, shut that down. But in these days, it was horrible. And um, Rosalinda's mother had to go somewhere, and then she ended up uh, somehow... Uh, not being around anymore. So Kevin and Kim just took Rosalinda in. They, they did what they could. They fed her with a little uh, uh, milk bottle. They nursed her back to health. They went to the library. They did some basic understanding of hygiene and nutrition. They, they got some money together. They took her to a doctor. And they kept her for um, several months and got her back on track again. And then she went off and she got into an orphanage and she grew. Fast forward about 18 years later, they, were at, they, were, they left the Philippines, went to India, did some planting out there, and then came back for a visit to the Philippines. And who comes bounding up to uh, Kevin and Kim in this meeting but Rosalinda, a healthy, vibrant, smiling, joyful 19-year-old girl going through one of our discipleship schools, training to become a missionary, and just going for it with God. And we look at that, or we look at a Michelle, and we don't realize, well, here's Michelle, man, she's going for it. But there was a lot of little things along the way that helped her to get there. And this is something that I think we need to understand is that God doesn't always call us to big things. Sometimes he calls us to little things that he wants to make big. And so I believe one of the keys to the successful Christian life or a joyful Christian life, rather than striving and competing and trying to get big and get frustrated if you don't, and, and we pastors go through it as well. Uh, I do it as an author. I, I, I'm, I've never talked to Waxer about it, but I'm sure he has struggled with it. You know, how come he's got a bigger church than I do? I got a small church. You know, and, and it is really weird. We do the same thing the world does. We go to pastors' conferences and, oh, <laughs> he's got 5,000 people in his church. Oh, he must be big. Oh, he's only got 50 people in his church. Oh, he must be. Isn't it nuts? When we're following the mighty Lamb of God who, who was as big as you can get, God in the flesh, the creator of the universe, came down from heaven, washed his disciples' feet, not only lived among us knuckleheads all that time, died on the cross, and not only died, but died the most humiliating, degrading, lowest form of death you can get, which is crucifixion. Yeah. And he did it for us. Why don't we follow his example more? Yeah. We look at Jesus and we say, I want to be big. We want Resurrection Sunday. We don't want Good Friday. We don't want to do the next big thing, which sometimes... Uh, can be just uh, a little thing. In 1961, there was a man by the name of uh, Edward Lorenz. Edward was a uh, scientist slash um, a meteorologist. And so he was trying to figure out a weather pattern. Back in those days, 1961, computers were about as big as refrigerators. So he goes up and he punches in a couple of numbers on, on his little... Uh, docket here and he goes up and up to 0.509741 and he goes off and gets a cup of coffee comes back takes several minutes to calculate the end of the weather pattern and he comes back and he realizes instead of 0.509741 he punched in 0.509742 so he was a hundredth of a thousandth of a percentage point off in his in his data uh, input into the computer and the computer came out with a totally different weather pattern than he would have expected if he would have put that other little number in there so he was kind of confused by this so he took it to a bunch of his uh, scientific um, affiliation you know they had a big conference and they were very impressed and he showed these folks this and one of the other scientists who was putting on the conference because he didn't give a name or a title to his uh, talk they said Dr. Edward Lorenz gave a talk called Can a Butterfly's Wings That Flap in Brazil Be the Ultimate Cause of a Tornado in Texas? 
Now, we've all heard that before, like in pop language and stuff. But that's what they tabulated. They thought, a lot of people thought these scientists guys were a little off their rocker. Until in the early 90s with uh, m modern technology and so forth, they actually proved it can happen. That a butterfly can actually flap its wings and start the process going of, of minuscule molecules banging against one another in a random chaos type of way and ultimately several years down the line, bang, there can be a hurricane in Texas or tornado or whatever. Now, when we think about that kind of thing, we go, well, that's interesting. Now, the, science, the, the atheists love this see, because they say, you see, all of life is random chaos. Everything is made out of chance. You are a product of time plus matter plus chance. There is no meaning. There is no purpose or anything in your life. You can all be explained by molecules bounding together in some kind of random chaos theory, and uh, you have no meaning or purpose to your life. But I think it takes more faith to believe that than it does to believe that God created us. But getting back to the, to the butterfly effect, and how does it relate, what they call the butterfly effect, how does that relate to us in our lives or, for instance, in our Christian life? Now, by the way, I'm going to let you off the hook. We're not in bondage to random chaos theory, you know. I'm going to get hit by a truck this afternoon, and I guess I should, no. But um, how does it work? Speaking of getting hit by a truck, let me tell you a story. <laughs> I was uh, um, sitting at my computer about a year and a half ago, and this, um, you know, one of these random, look at this came in. You know, it was a little video clip of a guy standing at a um, crosswalk. And so I hit the little thing. It was only about two minutes long. And uh, this guy's standing at the crosswalk, and he dutifully waits for the light to change. The light changes to green. He walks in the middle of the crosswalk very legally. But unfortunately, there was a drunk driver coming down this way and uh, went straight through the red light. Another truck was going this way, and this car banged into that truck. That truck rolled over a couple times, whacked over the unsuspecting pedestrian in the middle of the highway. He's laying there on the ground. Papers are going everywhere from his briefcase. The police officers come. The paramedics come. They take him to the hospital. He survives. And as he's laying in his hospital bed, he gives that question that we would all give at a time like this. Why me? <laughs> Why did this happen to me? Now, to answer that question, you would have to know why and how were those three people in that intersection at that exact same time? Why were they there? To answer that question, you would have to know every choice that the pedestrian made up until the time that he got there. Now, why was he in that um, crosswalk? Well, because he got off early that day and the boss let him off. Why did the boss let him off early? Well, because the boss's daughter had soccer practice and he had to go help his wife take the daughter to soccer practice and blah, 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 blah. And that's how he got there. How was the drunk driver in that intersection? He was a young 16-year-old kid that got in a fight with his parents. Why did he get angry and get, after he got in a fight with his parents? And why was he driving so erratically? Well, he learned that from his father. Uh, and why did he get drunk? Well, because his father got drunk. Why did his father get drunk? Well, his father was in the Vietnam War. Why was his father in the Vietnam War? Well, because there was this guy named McNamara, and there was a Gulf of Tonkin incident. Why did that happen? And this guy lied about this, and this happened. And you could go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and try to figure it out. Now, there's been a couple of movies that have tried to portray this. There was one with Gwyneth Paltrow a couple years ago called Sliding Doors. And in the trailer to the movie, she, in the first, first part of the movie, she comes down a subway stairs in order to catch a subway train. She goes down, and she's really in a hurry because she sees the train's about to go, and a little girl is in her way coming right up the side as she's going down the banister. And so she gets out of the little girl's way, and she runs, and she can't get to the sliding doors. So she missed her train. Then the camera switches back, and she's going back down, same time, same station, running down. The little girl is coming up the steps, but the little girl's mother gets the little girl out of the way, so that split second of time was saved, and Gwyneth Paltrow runs right by and makes it onto the train. And the rest of the movie describes what would have happened to her life if she caught the train and what her life would be like if she missed the train. Now, this can get you neurotic if you think about it too much, and <laughs> relax. The Bible says our times are in his hands. Amen. But the point of the matter is, to quote another movie that you've all seen before, every Christmas time, we love the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Yes. Doesn't that just make your heart pitter-patter when you see the end of that movie and they're singing Auld Lang Syne? And it's all, it's all good with the world because George Bailey now gets it that he was a significant part of making his town a good town. 
and the angel Clarence comes by as George Bailey's about to kill himself because he realizes he thinks his life is a failure because he hasn't been able to do the big thing and save the town from the mean old Mr. Potter. And so Clarence says, well, let me show you what the town would look like without you. He wouldn't have been able to be there to save his brother's life, so his brother wouldn't have been able to be a war hero, and he wouldn't have been able to do this because Mr. Potter was there, and everything would have been different because of him. You got Biff Tanner in the, in the um, Back to the Future movies and so forth. These are all pop ways to help us think about how our lives interact with other people. Now, God is in heaven directing harvest operations on the earth. And he sees a Rosalinda down here, and he sees a willing worker down here, and he causes a butterfly effect to get Kevin and Kim to the Philippines at the right place, at the right time, at the right garbage dump, at the right little hovel there, while she is up, and all of that worked out. God is able to help us to realize little things make a big difference. We're in the middle of the final four right now, and if you do any kind of a, you ask anybody who's into basketball, ask them who is the greatest basketball coach in college history? John Wooden. If you said anybody else, you're wrong. Okay. <laughs> because I have the microphone and my opinion counts. John Wooden has won more basketball championships than anybody else. That's my criteria. And um, John Wooden would get his players together, and he would have Bill Walton come in on a scholarship, and Bill Walton would sit down and think he deserved special treatment, and all the other guys, and he would sit them down, and he'd say, you guys, this is a basketball. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. This is a pair of socks. I want to teach you how to fold your socks. These guys are going, what do you mean? Yeah, I'm going to teach you how to fold your socks, because you see, if you have creases in your socks, and you don't put your socks on properly, uncreased uh, or, or creased socks can cause blisters. Blisters can hamper performance. Hampered performance can mess you up in your practices, and your practices can mess you up in your games, and the difference between a creased sock and an uncreased sock can be the difference between a champion and near champions. Little things matter. They go, oh, well, he's just a neurotic old man. What is it? Well, you come back 14 championships later and let me know if he was a nutcase. So what does God think of our little things? Well, let's, let's look a little bit more at this guy, Ananias. And I want to talk about three aspects of Ananias' life that we want to look at. And they're all in the text, the two texts uh, that I just read. Number one, Ananias was a man of character. He was a man of character. Now, he's also a man of good reputation. And I want to talk the difference between character and reputation. Um, well, the, f the first point is he was faithful to what God told him to do. And then secondly, uh, he was a man of good reputation. So if you hear anything else out of this message today, hear this. That God wants you to be a person of faithfulness. Very interesting. Uh, in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul is getting ready to get into a big explanation of what ministry is all about. Now, you all know, you're well-taught Bible teacher, that, that it's not waxers in the ministry, and I'm not in the ministry. I'm in a secular job. No, we all know we're all in the ministry. We're all priests. We're all ministers. Waxers called a minister in a church. You're called a minister in your school or in your job or in your neighborhood or your family or whatever. So we're all in the ministry there, and um, ministry is a stewardship, it says. And it says in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, it is required in stewardship that someone be found to be faithful. So we need to be faithful. If you're here today, you're here tomorrow. If you give your man of your word or woman of your word, when you say yay, it's yay. When you say nay, it's nay. You're honest, you're, you're full of integrity. You're a faithful person, which means you're full of faith and you live according to what you say. What you see is what you get. That's a faithful person. So it's required in stewardships. It says we're stewards of the mysteries of God, that we've all got this gospel, this word of God, this, this kuleana that we have from God, and God is requiring us to be good stewards and to be faithful of that. M most of you have uh, heard of Greg Laurie, m familiar with his ministry. Greg Laurie had, uh, Billy Graham actually said Greg Laurie was his favorite preacher. I was driving around Waipahu with Greg one day and I said, Greg, how do you handle that? How do you handle being a preacher and having the greatest preacher in human history tell the whole world that you're his favorite preacher? 
I said, if Billy Graham would have said, I'm his favorite preacher, I would have started the Danny Lehman Preacher Magazine and tried to sell it to the whole world and told him, hey, did you know what Billy Graham said about me? And, you know, and I said, how do you handle without getting full of pride? And you know, he gave me a couple tips and so forth. So, but I was just thinking about that. And then I heard Greg tell the following story. Somebody asked him in a pastor's conference, how did you get started in the ministry? Because now he's got a big ministry. He preaches to... Um, 60,000 people at Anaheim Stadium. He's getting ready to do a massive na national thing on the internet. Um, he reaches more people in a day than most of us would reach in a lifetime for Christ. He's got this big ministry. But how did his ministry start? It started because he was a teenage convert and he felt like God had given him a couple of messages out of the Bible and he wanted to preach them. So he went up to Pastor Chuck Smith and he says, Chuck, I feel like God's called me to the ministry. And Chuck said, good, why don't you go see Romaine over here, my assistant pastor. So Greg goes over to see the assistant pastor. He says, I feel like God's calling me to the ministry. And, and uh, Pastor Romaine gets an a, a old chock full of nuts uh, coffee can. Gives him the coffee can and he says, Greg, can you go out into the parking lot? Some of the fellows around here are uh, smoking and sometimes they don't put the cigarette butts in the proper receptacles and they, they put them out on the ground. So go pick up cigarette butts off the ground and make sure we want to clean up our parking lot. And Greg said, that's ministry? That's ministry. <laughs> and if you ask Greg today what ministry is all about, he'd probably tell you the story of the cigarette butts. Because we have to understand that if God tells you to pick up a cigarette butt off the parking lot, it is just as big as preaching to 10,000 people in a big crusade because God told you to do it because God is big. But we don't look through God's lenses of big and little most of the time. We look through our own lenses. So are we faithful? And here you have... Ananias saying, yes, Lord. Now, if God wants something to be done in your kuleana, in your orbit, in your area of your life, what does he have to do to get through to you? Can he just say, Danny, yes, Lord. Or is he going to say, hey, Danny, yeah, I want you to go do thus and so. Well, you know, I'm Danny Lehman. I need a little bit more advance notice, you know. I mean, uh, let me see if I can fit you into my little thing here. Uh, can you imagine Jesus walking around Galilee with one of these? You know, <laughs> you know, blind Bartimaeus is on the side of the road. Son of David, have mercy on us. Uh, I'm sorry, I got a one o'clock with the woman at the well. Uh, I'll be back a little bit later. And then I got to, I got to, tonight I got to stay up late and talk to Nicodemus. But uh, then I'm going to be, can you imagine Jesus doing that? I think Jesus was a little bit more free-flowing, a little bit more, uh, what can I do for you, Bartimaeus? Oh, son of David, that I may receive my sight. Oh, let me see what I can do for you here. Woo! And he was interrupted many times. One time he's ministering, and who touched me here? You know, he's trying to figure out who touched him. You know, the disciples say, I don't know, the crowd's big. I can't tell who touched you. You should know you're God. And then he gave them a theological treatise that uh, I came down from heaven and emptied myself of that. No, he didn't do that. But um, the, the point has to be with being faithful. Chuck Swindoll has a great little saying in one of his books. He calls it having a yes face or a no face. A yes face is somebody that you need a favor from. Now, anybody here ever get in a jam besides me? I get in jams all the time. I get in trouble all the time. I need help. I need favors. I don't know why it is, but I'm, I'm always needing a favor. So I call somebody, who do you call when you need a favor? Now, a little theological thing here. The word favor means grace. Grace means favor. Grace is unmerited favor. God makes us his favorites and gives us his grace, and that's how we're able to get saved. So are we people of grace? Are we people of favor? When you need a favor, who comes across your mind? And let's turn the tables. Are you a face that comes across people's minds when they need a favor? I had a situation happen to me a couple years ago, and long story short, but I needed help. It was a last minute thing, and um, I had an opportunity to do a big concert in Honolulu uh, with this band that was coming through. They had a concert in Hilo that was canceled, and they said, we can come to Honolulu. So I called my pastor, Bill Stoneberg. I said, Bill, can I have the building uh, for free because I don't have any money? <laughs> he, said, he said, oh, sure. I said, I want to give two altar calls, an altar call for salvation and an altar call for missions. And he said, oh, great, Danny, go for it. Praise the Lord. So he gave me the building. I called a couple ladies in the church to make food for the band. Uh, I called the janitor guy. I got him all set. I called the different mission organizations and told them they could set up a free table and so forth and then I called up the uh, with this other group and I said uh, I said hey I need somebody to help me with this thing and, and on the other end of the line was 
Well, it's kind of a last minute. It kind of reminded me of the Weiner family on uh, Saturday Night Live. But, um, well, I don't know, you know, and it's kind of last minute. And, you know, Danny, you do this a lot. I said, hey, okay, okay. So I hung up the phone and I said, Lord, I don't, meet, I don't need a lecture on being last minute layman. I need a favor, okay? I don't need you to tell me how irresponsible I am. I realize it's late notice. I realize it's last minute. I just need a favor. So I hung up the phone from that guy, and then, um, then I went on and I did the concert. Anyway, he said he was going to do it, and then he forgot and something. So I'm 45 minutes before the concert. The table is empty. I don't have anybody to advertise uh, the missions or anything. And so I called back, and I said, uh, oh, oh, no. Then, then I, I said, I called back, and he said, oh, I forgot. And I said, oh, okay, I'll, t- I'll talk to you later. So right, what is in my mind now? I got 45 minutes. I need to have a table set up. I need somebody to drop everything and do me a favor. Now, I'm not trying to be spiritual here. I just put yourself in my position. You're in a hurry. You need a favor. You need it now. You don't have time to even pray about it. You need help. So different faces went across my mind. Well, I could call. No, if I call him, I'm going to get a lecture. I don't need a lecture. (laughs) If if I call him, he's going to start whining. If I call him, you know, okay. And then this girl crosses my mind. Her name was Ashley. Hey, Ash. Hey, Danny. I need help. What do you need? I said, I need, I, need, I need a table set up. I need a video thing set up. I need the brochures. Go into my office, get the brochures, and get on the freeway. Uh, with the traffic, you'll be able to be here in 40 minutes, just in time for the concert. And she said, well, I'm nursing my baby right now. I said, drop the baby and drop everything you're doing. I need a favor. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't say that. So she ends up doing it because she had a yes face. But then... I wasn't trying to be judgmental on my other friend. I was saying, well, maybe I give vibes like that, too, when somebody calls me. Well, don't you know that, uh, you know, Brother Danny, this is Brother Sahib. I met you in 1994, and we took photo. So could you come pick me at airport? We have a cup of chai. You told me you'd give me chai. I said, that was 1994. And he says, that's okay. I'm at the airport. I'm on my way to Kona, and I need pickup. Now, if I have a yes face, I say, Praise the Lord, I'll be there not only with a cup of chai, I'll give you 50 bucks to help you on your way, and I'll be able to give you some samosas, and we're going to have a good old time. Hallelujah. If I have a no face, it's, well, you know, uh, you know, I kind of, I'm a busy person, you know, and I'm on the global leadership team, and I'm an elder at my church, and, and I'm a really big person. You don't understand who you're talking to. Don't you know who I am? And then the Holy Spirit says, no, we don't know who you are. Why don't you tell us who you are? (laughs) I'm a sinner saved by grace. That's all I am. I'm sorry, Lord. I'm such a wicked sinner. I do that. (laughs) How many of you know God's not impressed with us? We're big. Now, to tell a more serious story, one day, one night, I didn't do the next big thing. Uh, we had a guy who used to come to our youth with a mission meeting. He's since passed away. But uh, he had gotten in a construction accident once, and as I understand it, a, 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 a sledgehammer hit him in the head or something, and he lost a lot of his mental facilities. And he was in a wheelchair, and he c- couldn't hardly do anything for himself. And he used to come to our meetings. The handicap van would pick him up and bring him to our youth with a mission meetings every Friday night. And traditionally, after our meetings, we go out on the streets, and we go to Hotel Street or Waikiki, and we preach the gospel, witness for Christ, help people in any way that we can. And um, I was leading the outreach this night, and I was really hyper to get the students out on the streets. Now, this guy, um, he personally really liked me. He liked my preaching, and I I took time to give him different teaching tapes and CDs and things like that, and and, uh, he was very appreciative. But when he would talk, uh, it was very hard for him to enunciate his words, and so he would, would, you know, just, just try as best that he could. And most of us did a really good job of just listening to him and trying to understand, oh, you need a glass of water? Hang on a second. And we would go serve the guy and do what we could. Not out of some patronizing nonsense, but just true Christian love. I feel like we passed the test, and I, and I think I did pretty good most of the time. But on this one night, I, was, I got a type A personality, and I'm kind of hyper, and so I was, I get the students in the van, and we got to, you know, the driver's the boss, and we're going to go down, and we're gonna, let's get down, and we're running a little late. And I was really in a hurry, and... Out of the corner of my eye, I saw John, and he, he tried to get my attention, and he, and he went, Danny, Danny, and he's trying to, to reach out to me, and I purposely distant, I purposely pretended that I didn't see him, although I did see him, 
And I, I was dishonest in the way that I reacted because I had to go do this big outreach. And so I shined him on and I went to the van, I got in the van and I got about halfway to down to Hotel Street and the Holy Spirit hit me like a ton of bricks. He said, oh, you are so big doing your big ministry thing, you didn't have five minutes to make this guy's day. The highlight of his week is to come to your meetings. He's got to sit in the personal prison of that wheelchair every day of his life. If you were in a wheelchair for 15 minutes, you'd be complaining to me left and right. And you were too big to have time for five minutes to brighten his day. And I got so convicted. I, tears come to my eyes. And I lost my opportunity that night. But I didn't lose it after that. Because sometimes we're just, we, we just got to twist it. Do we have time to love people? And sometimes even in the ministry, we're too big at doing this that we don't do this. We don't help the blind Bartimaeuses of our world or the Nicodemuses that come at night. Uh, wait a minute, Nicodemus, I only have office hours from 9 to 5 and you're coming to me at night. I, I'm not, no, that was when Nicodemus came and that's when Jesus was available. So let's go through some of this, uh, some more things. He was, number one, he was faithful. Number two, he had a good reputation. Now, your reputation is what people think of you. Your character is who you really are. Ananias didn't try to have a good reputation. It says in the text that he was a devout man and he had a great relationship with God and he, his character was together, so therefore his reputation was good. What is your reputation? When your face crosses somebody's mind, will they call you? Or do you come across as too busy? Or are you, when you say to somebody, hey, let me know how I can help. Somebody in the church has got cancer. Somebody in the church is, hey, hey, just let me know how I can help. You gonna be there? Or are you you're just saying that because that's the thing to, hey, praying for you, bro. Do you pray for him? Those kinds of things. Are we willing to do the little things and let God make them big? I wonder who prayed for that particular Compassion International outreach that got the person to give the 15 bucks or whatever it was to get Michelle on the list where she was number 37. I wonder who, nobody knows. Nobody knows the businessman's name in Charlotte, North Carolina in 1933 that was in a businessman's meeting and says, you know, the teenagers here in Charlotte are getting kind of wild and we need to have an evangelist come in and straighten them out and preach the gospel. Well, I know this guy named Mordecai Ham. Let's get him. So they get some money together. They get Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham preaches the gospel, gives an invitation at a high school youth rally in 1933. A tall, skinny kid comes forward to accept Christ who was a high school baseball player, 17 years old. His name was William Franklin Graham. We all know who he is because he's big, but we don't even know the name of the guy who had the idea to invite Mordecai Ham in. Everything is interrelated, and we need to recognize that but it all starts out with character, faithfulness, and a good reputation. Another thing about Ananias is he was, he was honest. Don't you love it when the Lord says, Ananias, go talk to this guy Saul. And he goes, Lord, with all due respect, I know you're busy with the nations and all that kind of stuff, and you've got to keep the stars up there where they're supposed to be and the moon and the tides. And the, but Lord... I don't know if you've heard about this guy, but he's causing great problems for all the Jews in the area. I mean, all the Christians, and he's, he's persecuting Christians. Lord, I don't know what. And the Lord just says, that's okay. God doesn't get mad at him. He doesn't reprimand him. He listens to his complaints and says, that's okay, Ananias. Just do what I tell you. Everything's going to work out fine. And so he was honest. Last thing, or the fourth thing, he was obedient. He just did what God told him to do, and he was also faithful in the details. He did exactly what, I want you to go do this. I want you to lay hands on him so he can get healed. And then after he gets healed, I want you to get him filled with the Holy Spirit. Then I want you to tell him that he needs to know me. He needs to see, the, he needs to do this. He needs to go to the Gentiles. He needs to go to the kings. And he gave the exact details that God gave him. God was in the little details and he knew that. And he was also loyal. Loyal as a friend. Now imagine, put yourself into this, this um, mentality right here. Here's a guy, he's breathing out threatenings and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He's ready to knock out these Christians. Bang, knocked down, blind for three days, 72 hours to think about it. He's in an emotional upheaval. He probably thinks all the Christians in the world hate him because he's been trying to persecute him. Here's a representative of the Christian church, knocks on the door. Uh, is this Saul of Tarsus? Uh, yeah, who's that? I can't see anything. Uh, it's um, Ananias. I know you don't know me. Oh, I know you. God spoke to me and told me you were coming. Come on in. I can't find the door. So Ananias comes in, sits down with the blind guy, says, boom, prays for him, and he's healed. 
And he said two things. It says in the, in, the, in the account in chapter 22, it says, and he stood beside me. Isn't that beautiful? He didn't come say, hey, I'll, first of all, I want to make sure you're really repentant, man. We're going to put you through six months of catechism classes. We're going to make sure you understand what that Calvary Chapel dove is all about. And we're going to make, you know, and we're going to give the dog. No. He believed in him. How many of you know it's wonderful when you can believe in somebody? I'm so glad somebody believed in me. I'm sitting on a beach in California 38 years ago or so, and somebody gave me a gospel track, and I'm giving all kinds of rama lama dang, dang, about God, and they just love me anyway. And they brought me into a place, and I said, well, I believe that God is in the UFOs, and he's in the stars, and God is in everybody, and everybody's God, and it's kind of cool, and kind of a mixture of Hinduism and Buddhism, and a little bit of New Age, and a little bit of health foods, and a little bit of, you know, <laughs> spirulina, a little bit of organic chemistry, you know, let's just make... That's okay. You just read this book, Danny, and you listen to these tapes and you'll get straightened around. They loved me enough and they believed in me. And how thankful I am for those few times when somebody believed in me. After I was a Christian for a while, I was kind of frustrated where I was living in California and I knew God was calling me to something else, but I didn't know what it was. And this Tongan guy came through town, preached at my church. I really liked his preaching, so I volunteered to take him to the airport. His name is Kalafi Mawala. So I was talking to him, and I said, you know, I really, I'm, I'm an evangelist, but I really feel I want to, you know, but I don't know if I'm supposed to do stadiums. I don't understand. I like it on the streets, but I don't, I'm kind of, a, you know, I'm kind of multiple personalities here. I don't know what God's telling me to do. <laughs> and he says, Danny, he says, you, you talk a lot about winning souls. That's good, but you need to think about discipling nations. Amen. It took him about 10 seconds to say that. <laughs> 10 seconds totally changed my life. A little word nations. Hmm, how do I do that? Well, then I got into the Word, and then I met up with some friends, and then I ended up changed the whole course of my life. Just a little encouragement goes a long way. Number two, Ananias was a man of, um, or he was competent. He was, he was, he was, he knew what he was doing, in other words. So, we need to be people of character, but we also need to know what we're doing. How many of you know you'd rather have a non-Christian brain surgeon work on you who was competent than a Christian brain surgeon who wasn't very competent? Everybody with me on that one? But why not have a Christian brain surgeon who's competent? That's the, that's the winner, right? And so are we competent people? Do we know what we're doing? And are we willing to do the next thing God tells us to do? I'm running short on time, so I want to get to my third point, which is that he was committed. Your heart is your, it's your cockpit of your life. It's how you drive your life. That's why Jesus said, love the Lord with all your heart. Because God wants us to have our heart committed to God. That's the difference between legalism, which is all uh, kind of a mental following rules and regulations and religious practices, and then having a heart that's given over to God. And that's the way this guy seems to be. He was a devout man. And he was committed to do what the Lord had called him to do. So, number one, he carried out his assignment. Number two, he obeyed God in the details. And number three, uh, he welcomed Saul into the kingdom of God. Now, just in closing, I want to tell you a cool story about an Indian friend of mine named Anil. Anil was a... um, uh, missionary up in northern India, up in the Calcutta area, and uh, just felt like God was telling him to go to the south and to serve down there. He didn't know what he was going to do. He just came down and wanted to be obedient, faithful. He had never heard about the next big thing, but he just basically wanted to do what God wanted him to do. He was wide open. He felt like he had finished what he had to start in Calcutta, and he came down. He was going to be a classic missionary, you know, preaching the gospel, trying to start a church, and trying to get things rolling in the southern India area. So he went to the city of Chennai, which is a city of about 8 million people. And in Chennai, there are 13 leper colonies. Now, the leper colonies in India, I mean, it would make Kalapapa look like it was the Hilton uh, on these leper colonies down there in India. And this, these folks' lot in life every day was to um, walk or sometimes crawl to the... To the um, downtown area where the businessmen were. If you know anything about Indian or a lot of non-Western countries, you have about 3% of the people that are loaded with money. In India, they call them the Brahmins because they're the, they're the wealthy. They're born into that caste, and so they get, they get the cream. And about 97% of people are poor. 
And so the poorest of the poor would be the lepers. And the lepers are also untouchable. The Brahmins don't touch the lepers because in the Hindu mind view, you don't want to touch that because they deserve that. That's part of their karma, which was left over from a previous life. And so you don't help anybody because you'll be messing up their karma by helping them out. And so don't help them out. They'll work off their karma and then they'll go to a better life in the next life. And some people say all the religions are the same and are teaching the same thing. That's another story. But um, Anil goes down and God sends him to one of these leper colonies. And he's walking around and, he, and he's, he's, he's itching to preach the gospel and the Lord just says, no, just open your eyes. Just look. Jesus said, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they're ripe already to harvest. He didn't say lift up your eyes and look in the mirror and think about yourself. He said, no, deny yourself, lift up your eyes, keep your eyes on Jesus and on the world that Jesus died for, the people that Jesus loves. Sometimes it's not too pretty. And I'm going to tell you, a leper colony is not very pretty. But Anil opened his eyes and he saw their daily routine. They would walk or crawl off into the, into the business district and then at 5, 6 o'clock at night they'd come back and they'd come back and there were sores all over their open wounds, all over their um, appendages, both their hands and their feet. And of course they couldn't feel anything because the nerve endings are dead there. But he would, uh, um, he just went into a local library, did a little bit of studying on leprosy, uh, knew a little bit about um, antibiotics and so forth. He got antibiotic clean, cream. He got med medicine to wash the, uh, their appendages and so forth, picked the cinders out of their, out of their, um, their wounds and so forth. And uh, still the Lord was saying, just love these people and serve them. And one, of the, one, of, one day one of the leaders came up to him and he said, what, why are you doing this? What's your angle? He said, well, I can't have an angle. What could you ever give me? You don't have anything. I'm here just because, I'll tell you why I'm here. Because a God of love has touched my heart. And he wanted me to touch your hearts, but first I got to touch your hands and I got to touch your feet. Because if Jesus was here, that's what he would do. And contrary to you deserving what you got, you got, what you, you got this because we're living in a fallen, sinful world. But Jesus Christ died on the cross not only to save you from the penalty of that sin, uh, but, for the, uh, but from the power of that sin. And I'm here just to help you out. And I'm not demanding that you become a Christian. I'm going to serve you anyway. Well, fast forward. A bunch of them did get saved. Fast forward about 15 years. And Anil now has 55 full-time staff working in all 13 leper colonies. They are now multiplying. They've got training schools and churches, and they're multiplying others. They're reaching lepers, that one forgotten, untouchable people group out in the middle of India. All because one guy, one guy heard from God to do the next big thing. So the next big thing might be the person on the way out that needs a hug. It might be a person who needs an encouraging word like Kalafi gave to me. It might be just going up and say, it's good to have you here. It might be talking to somebody who you haven't seen at church for a while and say, man, really missed you, or, or whatever it might be. Or maybe it doesn't have to be anything religious. Maybe it can just be, hey, let's hang together sometime, or something like that, just to spread the love of Jesus uh, and to the world that he called us to reach. So say, oh, me, or amen. <laughs> let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for the simplicity of doing the next big thing. I want to pray that you'd set us free from an endless pursuit of big and help us to pursue Jesus, who sometimes is in the little things. I want to pray, Father, that whether it's big or little in man's eyes, that we would be faithful to do what you've called us to do. Whether it's picking up cigarette butts on the parking lot, whether it's giving somebody an encouraging word, or whether it's selling our house and moving to India and being missionaries ourselves. We just pray that we would do little, big, and in between, all simply because we're being obedient to you. So, Father, would you help us uh, to be people of the next big thing? Just while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, uh, really the next big thing in your life might be to get right with God. And if you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, or you have given your life to the Lord before, but you know you've fallen away. And God's got, his, God's got your number today, and he's just simply saying, do the next big thing. Make the choice to surrender your life to the Lord. And we're not going to have a lot of fanfare or an official altar call, but I just want to give you an opportunity to acknowledge that and say, Danny, I want to surrender my life to Jesus this morning. I want the whole enchilada. I want the life of Christ. I'm willing to exchange my life for his because I realize his life 
is bigger and better and more fulfilling than any life I can have. I surrender the throne of my life and I give my life to Christ. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you're in that position and you want to make that decision, I'd like you to slip your hand up right where you are so that I can pray for you. I see your hand there, sister. Anybody else? Just uh, anybody else? This is just your time to be able to make a decision for the Lord. I'm looking around. We're not going to drag this out all morning, but just seeing. Anybody else? You say, today's my day. I want to surrender to the Lord. Anybody else? Okay, Lord, we just um, rejoice that everybody here knows you or they're putting it off the decision until later. And we respect them in doing that, Lord, just like you respect us. Help us now, Lord, as we go to be obedient in everything you tell us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.